The mic. Can you hear me? Yeah, so good. Good to have you, Tom. I really appreciate it. It's it's uh it's a cool topic. We've spent a lot of time with with dark sky kind of awareness. Eileen's a big advocate and done a lot of work on it too. So thank you so much. And okay. Over to you. Ready to go. Next slide. Uh, we all know that light pollution has been increasing during our lifetime. Actually, it's been increasing faster than the rate of population growth. Recent information suggests it's growing by as much as 10% per year. If it continues at that rate in two decades, we will have lost the night sky. There will be no visual observation. The mission of Dark Sky International is to keep that from occurring. And the question I'm going to be asking each of you tonight is what are you doing to save the night sky? Let's go to the next. As introduced, I'm Tom Reinert. I'm the president of Dark Sky International. I've had that position since January. I've been in the board about two years, and I've been active with the organization for about a decade. I am a retired DC lawyer. I dealt with labor issues, mostly with railroad and airline employees, negotiated with pilots and stuff like that, um, which dealt with complicated scientific information in many cases, surprisingly. I also spent a decade as, in my spare time, as a water pollution advocate in the Chesapeake Bay area. I lived in um, Annapolis for about 15 years and I was board member and president of an organization known as the South River Federation. It's now um, Arundel Rivers. At the time I transitioned from water pollution to light pollution, South River Federation and the International Dark Sky Association were the same size organizations. They each had eight employees and a budget of about a million. South River Federation had as its mission cleaning up one river in Maryland. International Dark Sky Association has had as its mission cleaning up light pollution on the entire planet. We are a small organization with a huge mission. We've punched above our weight for many years. Uh, but at this point, we really need to grow to address the problem of light pollution. I am an amateur astronomer. I'm a NOVAC member. I uh, did amateur astronomy as a kid, then I went by the wayside when I went to school, and I came back to it about a decade ago, and I want to talk about why. I'm going to the next slide. Um, in February 2013, I went to the Kitt Peak Observatory outside Tucson. A uh, great night program. I remember walking outside the visitor center after dark and seeing the darkest sky I had ever seen. And most, I remember the Andromeda galaxy. I looked up there. It looked at the size of my index finger and arm's length. And I said, wow, where have you been all my life? But that soon became a serious question. Where had you been all my life? Why hadn't I seen this before? And that led me to the International Dark Sky Association and the issue of light pollution, where I've been working pretty much uh, since 2013, starting uh, counseling them on some policy and legal issues. Um, I am not the day-to-day -day manager of Dark Sky International. We have Ruskin Hartley, yeah, next slide, who's uh, a wonderful executive director. He's really talented. He just came back from China, Taiwan, certifying Dark Sky Parks, and then testifying in Britain to the House of Lords on light pollution, where they're considering uh, legislation. Um, very talented. We have a board of 14 people from all over the world, multiple disciplines. Uh, let me just talk to you about a, a few of them. Uh, Connie Walker is the wife of Chris Walker, who was here last month. She's an astronomer at the NOIR lab. I'll be talking about Globe of Night and satellite constellations. She is the, the major professional astronomer dealing with the satellite constellation issues. Um, who else do we have here? We have uh, Mike Simmons, was the founder of Astronomers Without Borders, 
Fernando Avila is also a Mexican professional astronomer. He was instrumental in getting a national uh, light pollution statute in Mexico. Uh, Nalani Brito Davis is an economist, uh, but she's also the head of the New Zealand Amateur Astronomy Group. Um, and uh, Ken Walzak's really interesting. He, he leads STEM efforts at the Adler Planetarium, and he's been doing things like putting up weather balloons with uh, sensors on them and has mapped light pollution all over Chicago down to the building level. So very creative, dedicated bunch of people, which I'm proud to be working with. My role is to lead them and to help supervise the, the leadership, the, the, the executive director and the staff. And we've been involved in a great deal of strategic discussions in the last couple of years. Next slide. Most of you know uh, the International Dark Sky Association. It was formed in 1988 by a professional and amateur astronomer and really started as an astronomer's organization to deal with light pollution and grew over the years to uh, encompass other disciplines, which I'll talk about some more. Um, astronomers led in identifying light pollution as a problem. My colleague, Nalani Brito Davis, she says it's because they're the only ones looking up at the sky. No one else is. They're looking down at the ground. And there's some truth to that. What we uh, are probably best known for is the Dark Sky Places program. We have certified over 200 dark sky places, mostly public parks, around the world. We have five in Virginia. Many of you have worked on that process of getting certification. But around the world, it is very prestigious to be certified as an international dark sky park. It's important for astrotourism. It is our brand. It is so popular that we have certified just over 200 places. We have applications for another 200, and we're trying to get through them because it is so popular. Um, we have been responsible for bringing attention to light pollution and the principal organization on the planet doing that. We have a network of advocates who are doing it locally, but that's probably between dark sky places and increasing more awareness, our greatest accomplishment. Next slide. But we are changing our organization. We're changing our name, we're changing our mission, and we're changing our focus and assertiveness because it's necessary to address light pollution. We're now known as Dark Sky or Dark Sky International. As you'll see, the, the Dark Sky designators for all our constituent organizations as well. International is an explanation of which branch of Dark Sky we are. There is no abbreviation. It's either Dark Sky or nothing. No DSI, we're not using an abbreviation. Um, why have we done this? Next slide. Well, actually the rebranding started, it was very much social media internet based. We're revising our website. We needed a little bit uh, better looking brand, an easier uh, logo. And we actually always had problems because, you know, people would say dark sky, dark sky with the hyphen, that's actually what our name is. Dark sky without the hyphen, dark skies, IDA, IDSA, IDA, IDSA, you know. So we wanted to uni make it uniform dark sky. But it happened as we were doing this, our board was engaged in last year, a year long strategic review of the organization, which produced many changes I'll talk about. And the rebranding is concurrent with changes in the organization. We are an, an organization from whom you're gonna hear a more, more urgent message because it's necessary and it's going to be a broader coalition of which astronomers are an important part, but not the sole part. We need to broaden uh, our coalition. Next slide. This is just the, the generic dark sky. And if you go to the next slide, this just shows how we'll use it with all our constituent organizations. And it actually turns out it translates very well, which is a good thing. Next slide. I said at the outset, light uh, pollution is increasing. For some years, we've had data that indicates it's increasing about 2 to 3% annually based upon satellite observations of light, 
coming up through the satellites. Uh, a new study suggests actually it's much more than that. It's 9.6%. And the study was in Science Magazine in January. Uh, Connie Walker, who I mentioned earlier, is one of the authors. Uh, Chris Kaiba is a German physicist, former IDA board member, another author. And this uh, really brought attention to the fact that light pollution is increasing much more than we had thought. Why is that so? How is that so? Well, it was based on a program, you can do the next slide, called um, uh, Globe at Night. This was actually something Connie Walker created. Globe at Night's a program for people around the world, citizen scientists, it's an education program as well, to keep track of pollution. And the way it works is um, it actually is a, a, a smartphone app, um, and the app is used for both recording, um, assessing skies, and recording data. The next slide. What you really do is you look at the constellation Orion, and you compare what you see to these charts, and that basically you're categorizing it according to limited magnitude. So if you're bad, it's magnitude one. If you're good, it's magnitude seven. You record that, it goes into a database, also your geographical location. Next slide. Well, it turns out that we had generated about 50,000 data points on this. A lot of data, but we knew some of it was not very good uh, because you, you have some kids trying the program. So what they did is they basically did a data refining mining exercise. They went and they looked at people who had done multiple year observations from the same location. And they also did some other statistical tests. And it actually reduced the data to about 5,000 most reliable observations. And when they looked at those, they found that it showed that uh, light pollution had been increasing at 9.6%. Well, why would that possibly occur? And you know, that's a big discrepancy, two to three versus 9.6. Um, actually, in the same Nature uh, edition, there's a, a Italian physicist, Falski, who's done a lot of the satellite observation to explain. First of all, it's angle of light. We've known for a long time, the worst light pollution is not the light that goes straight up. It's the light that's going 20 to 45 degrees above the horizon, because that's bouncing off the atmosphere uh, versus just leaving. The other thing is color of light. The satellite observations have tended to be broadband observations, and there have been some observations that have focused on the frequency of color of light, and those observations have actually shown, because of the transition to LEDs, uh, that the blue pollution has increased much more than the other uh, wavelengths. So the explanation is basically the angle of light and the impact of the transition to LEDs with more blue light. Let me go next slide. So why is light pollution increasing at this rate? What's causing it? Well, we've got population growth around the world. Um, in the United States, and I'm going to use as a reference point 1969 because some of us were alive then and those who don't or weren't know about the moon launch. So that's a good reference of what the late 60s were like. Well, the population in the United States has increased 70% since 1969. Not quite doubling, but that's a substantial increase. And where has it gone? It's gone into suburban sprawl. Tyson's Corner used to be a gas station, right? We're, here we are, you know, we're in Northern Virginia. We're exhibit one of population expansion through suburbanization. If you look at most of the major city, growing cities in the country, look at Houston, Phoenix, they're suburbs, they're just huge suburbs. Well, that type of distribution actually generates more light pollution than more concentrated cities. Actually, rural areas, generate more light pollution per capita than New York City. So we've had this, this spread of population with lighting, and we know the lighting that goes in suburbs. It's a lot of 
car parking lot. Well, automobiles are the other big cause. Uh, I said that the uh, population has increased 70% since 1969. Number of automobiles in the United States has increased 120%, almost twice as much. What does that mean? Families went from one car to two cars. That's pretty much the story. And much of our light pollution is related to automobiles. The worst possible one being street lights. Street lights are the number one cause of light pollution. So why do you have street lights? Safety. No, we have street lights because power companies need to maintain load. They don't like variation in their output over the course of the day because it becomes a real technical problem for them. So they early on realized, well, we'll subsidize street lights. We'll pay for the installation. We'll give municipalities reduced prices for their electricity at night. So basically, we have as much street lighting as we do because it's a technical problem on power production. Now, that's actually an opportunity because we're transitioning to battery operated automobiles that need to be charged at night. We're also getting battery technology into homes. At some point, I believe, the power company is going to wake up and say, hey, wait a minute, we can sell this power for battery charging at night. Why are we giving it at a reduced rate to municipalities? There's potential for broad infra infrastructure change there that could reduce light pollution. Another big factor, transition to LEDs. About 10 years ago, this was the major issue IDA got involved in. Um, the problem with transition to LEDs, first of all, LEDs are more naturally blue, and they actually use uh, basically filters, reflectors, to get other light frequencies. Um, and they're very efficient, so they're cheaper. So they were sold to municipalities for streetlights Look, you, lighting is cheaper. So what do the municipalities do? Rather than say, hey, we're going to reduce our lighting costs, they'll say, we can get more light for the same money. So LEDs have actually increased the amount of lighting worldwide, not just here. So uh, the transition to LEDs have been a big issue. And then here's my own special thing. I call it mindless lighting. I've dealt with a lot of lighting professionals, lighting engineers, uh, lighting designers, they all get it. They hate light pollution, uh, devices that generate light pollution, not necessarily because they generate light pollution, because they have bad lighting. It's professionally an insult to them to see most of the lighting that occurs in our society. Because most of it occurs with no lighting engineer or lighting professional involved. Architect says, put up a light, contractor gets it, okay, uh, let me see, what's the cheapest light fixture I can put, slap it up on the side of the building. We have just a lot of bad lighting that no one ever thought about. It just got done, and that's a problem. Next slide. Now, while light pollution has increased, um, the, good, the good thing is awareness has increased. Um, I graduated from Harvard Law School. Six years ago, uh, I wanted to get an intern to come to IDA to do some basic work on the legal aspect of light pollution during a January term. So I called up the environmental project. There's a clinical project at Harvard run by an adjunct professor who was a 30-year environmental lawyer. So I need someone to go to Tucson for a month to work on light pollution. Her response, I will quote, light pollution, what's that? Never heard of it. Well, that conversation would not occur today, but it occurred six years ago. The last five years, we've seen an enormous increase in the publications about light pollution. We've got a Smithsonian exhibit going on now. You should all go see it. Um, for Dark Sky Week, we did a press release around the world different organizations. What we were surprised is how much media picked it up. When we did the analysis of the distribution of the media that picked it up, it was 882 million people circulation. So that means the message is getting out there. 
more people are aware. And the issue is transitioning awareness into action. I should also mention COVID. I think in the United States, many people with lockdown uh, stayed home, went into their backyard, decided to get into amateur astronomy, ordered a telescope, and then they looked up and realized it didn't look like when they were a kid. What had happened? And light pollution had changed the suburban backyard. And that has increased the awareness. Okay. I just want to briefly review why light pollution is a problem. We all know the astronomical aspect. But I got involved in this because of amateur astronomy. What keeps me going on this is largely the biological aspect, biodiversity and public health. We evolved, and most of the creatures on this earth evolved for dark and bright, day and night. And for 150 years, we've had electrical lights. And what happens with light is it disrupts our, our, our circadian rhythms, our night and day cycle. Um, for many species like bats, birds, insects, that can lead to extinction. And some of those are very important economically as pollinators. For human beings, it leads to a host of diseases. The hormonal cancers, prostate and breast, are associated with increased light pollution. Depression, anxiety, obesity. You can go down the list. Most of the modern ills are associated with increased light pollution. And I say to people, if you want to know why this is a public problem, Pick up your iPhone and notice that it has a nighttime mode that you can put on. Every phone, every smartphone has that. Why is that there? Because Apple and Microsoft and Google, all these Samsung, we're all interested in just giving us another feature. No, it's a product liability protection. They know that artificial light at night, blue light, has adverse health consequences, so they put on a feature to restrict it. So if they get sued about it in the future, they can say, well, you have this feature and you didn't turn it on. In fact, we can trace your history of use of that device and you never turned it on. So you're out of the class action. The health aspect is really serious. Um, energy, uh, we're part of the global warming problem. We're wasting a lot of energy on light, on light that we don't need and don't use. Um, but these are just, uh, you know, something we need to familiarize ourselves with because it is a much more pervasive problem than the astronomical interest. Go to the next slide. What is the solution? Well, the solution is basically reasonable lighting. Um, our executive director, Ruskin Hartley, and a guy at the Illuminating Engineer Society, Brian Libell, came up with the five lighting principles, which I think are brilliant as a communication device. Brian actually is working for IDA now. And we just identified five factors you need to think about on lighting. First one, is it useful? Why are you lighting? What's the point of the lighting? Is it decorative? Is it, is it safety? Is it to see something on the ground? Why are you doing it? The first question. Once you understand that, maybe you don't need the light. Maybe you need a different type of light. Targeted. This is shielding. Uh, you can't be shooting it up into the atmosphere. It needs to go down. You know those acorn lights? You ever see them all around, right? You know what acorn lights are designed for? For how they look during the day. Right. So we need to shield our lights for the purposes of using light responsibly. Lower light levels. Human light perception is based upon relative intensity. We do not need bright lights at night to see. We need low level lights at night to see. When we have bright lights, it ruins our night vision and we can't see anything in the shadows. Controlled, uh, timers, dimmers, uh, motion detectors, so that we're only using the light when we really need it. And finally, color. Preference for warmer light, that doesn't mean all warmer light. There are many lighting applications you need, brighter, uh, higher temperature light. Sports lighting needs to be brighter. Actually, even path lighting, we found you can do you know, yellow light on the, on the ground, but on peripheries, a little bit of blue light actually works better with human perception because we perceive the peripheral differently. 
But if you follow these principles where you're lighting, uh, it largely reduces the problem. I should also say nighttime moratoriums, which I'll talk more about. In the middle of the night, why is the light on? There just should be a lot of lights that get turned off. Okay, next one. So we sat down last year, the board of I, uh, IDA, before we transitioned to Dark Sky National, and said, what are we doing? Well, we need a new strategic plan. And we had uniformity of people, 14 people around the world, diverse interests. We recognized what we've done, awareness and dark sky places. But the sad fact is we had not stopped light pollution. And that's what we need to do. We need to stop light pollution. How are we going to do that? And the only way you get there is more activism. You need more legal uh, tools and more public policy emphasis. Expand the awareness, transition into action. That involves involvement of the government, um, regulators, the public, lighting industry, everyone in society. We also recognize that we had done a good job on preservation. That's what the dark sky places are doing. They're a, con a conservancy approach. But we need to restore as well. We need to go to places that have bad lighting and bring back the night. Um, and finally, we had to recognize we're a small organization. Our job is to give tools to our network of advocates. We cannot be out there doing this all by ourselves. So that was the basic approach. This just expresses it graphically. I'll make two points, though. When we think about government, we think about government as a regulator. Government is a huge consumer of light. Our problem, a major part of our problem, is bad public infrastructure. And we need to deal with the government as a consumer of lighting products. The other thing, as an environmental organization, we have to deal with industry. The only way you'll correct the problem is to get good lighting fixtures that can get out and be implemented. We talked to Lowe's and Home Depot. They're very receptive to marketing dark sky products. They can't find them. There aren't enough manufacturers making them. So we need to work with the manufacturers to get pro better products out there. All right. Broaden the coalition. As I said, we started as an astronomical organization. We can't rely upon professional and amateur astronomers to solve light pollution. There aren't enough of us. We don't have enough political influence. We have to build a coalition. People who are interested in biodiversity, people who are interested in human health, people interested in global warming. And it has to be truly an international approach because it's a problem all over the planet. So here's our new mission statement. I want to just highlight a couple of things. If you look at the vision, it talks about natural darkness at night. And the mission talks about restoring the nighttime environment. Actually, the only reference to the sky is down in inspiration, star-studded sky. That's intentional. We're talking about the entire environment of the night, not just the sky, because the biodiversity and the health aspect are not about what's in the sky. It's about the lighting that's around us and adversely affecting our health. Uh, the definition, the alteration of light levels in the outdoor environment from those occurring naturally due to human-made sources of light, basically saying, all light is a pollutant. That's not, that's actually scientifically accurate. Sending a photon of light into the atmosphere is no different than shooting a molecule. Uh, you're changing the environment. That doesn't mean you're going to eliminate all light. It means you need to realize that light is a pollutant. You need to mitigate the impact on the environment by responsibly controlling it. So I, hope that no one who's an amateur astronomer looks like this and says, well, this is less emphasis on astronomy. It is less emphasis on astronomy because it's emphasis on a larger picture of which astronomy is an important part. So we're not abandoning our astronomical base. We're trying to expand it as much as we can. I want to turn to talk to something that's purely an astronomical problem. These guys. Satellite constellations. Have you all seen these? Yeah, they're terrible, right? 
Um, and this is actually very early. This is 2019, the first Starlink constellations. So what do we know about satellite constellations? Well, we started from several thousand 18 lands on 12,000, way beyond the number of satellites. We're in, we're in lower Earth orbits. They reflect more light. And they and other organizations, the projections are we can have lights in orbit by 2030. Uh, and they increase sky glow. It's not just the individual point of light, it's sky glow. And as far as the individual point of light, if you get to this number, then about one out of every 15th object you see in the night sky is going to be moving. Think about that. Um, the problem, the base problem, is uh, commercial space is pretty much law west of the Pecos. There's not a good regulatory system. FAA has some authority, FCC has some authority, NASA has some authority, but there really is not a lot of regulation that is crafted to the problem. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, last year, uh, SpaceX went to the FCC, which controls radio frequencies and has approval power, and asked for more satellites. IDA, as well as several other organizations, intervened and said, okay, if you want to do that, you got to do a full environmental impact statement. And that is actually what the law requires. But the FCC said, no, we can shortcut it. There's no obvious environmental problem we're going to approve. So uh, IDA has gone to court to uh, challenge the FCC decision. And unfortunately, IDA is the only party doing that. Uh, only one willing to stand up to Starlink, apparently. Uh, and that's been briefed and is pending this year. Um, we don't know the outcome of that, uh, and it won't solve the problem. I will say, you may have read about the SpaceX hole in the ground in Texas. Yeah, same problem. The FAA approved. We don't need to do a full environmental review, and then you've got dirt being put on public lands because of that. So that actually might help us. But at best, we would get a remand to go back and uh, have the FCC look at it again. The base problem is we need a regulatory framework. And I would say the Europeans are looking at this seriously. They're concerned, and um, they may do something before we do. OK, let's see. I want to turn to, to you, us, what we have done and what we can do, because I think that's the most important thing I'll talk about today. Let's go to the next slide. Amateur astronomers have been great. Uh, we've increased public awareness through outreach. IDA was an amateur astronomers group. Uh, without amateur astronomers, there would be no dark sky places. They're the ones on the ground, taking the measurements, putting together the groups. Um, Club contributions, Novak, like many clubs, uh, gives a portion to dues to us. That's our lifeblood financially. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate it. But without it, IDA wouldn't be here. What's not so good? OK. I think um, light pollution has been a very difficult thing for us to deal with emotionally. I have heard anger. I've heard frustration. In March, I was visiting with a friend in Tucson who has a home observatory set in the, the foothills. And he was almost in tears, explained to me that the worst pollution in his visual field is the University of Arizona football field. Well, why should that bother him? University of Arizona has one of the best astronomy programs in the country. But what's worse, underneath the football stadium is the mirror lab where they build the mirrors for the largest telescopes on the planet. If they can't get their act together on getting some reasonable sports lighting, we have a problem. So that frustration's been there, and it's almost like the stages of mourning. You go from frustration to uh, resignation at some point. Coupled with that is we've developed pretty good technical solutions on light. We've got astrophotography has grown. 
um, electronically assisted uh, astronomy. I know I've got an EV scope. I know why you're doing this. Great. Go do astrophotography, EV scope. Try to overcome the, the light pollution. The problem is when that resignation gets coupled with technology and then it becomes complacency. You know, we really don't have to do anything about light pollution because we can't and it's hard and, well, we can do our astrophotography anyhow. That's a bad attitude. Let me, and I'll give you the example. This drove me nuts. This was in November, 2021, <laughs> sky and telescope ad, inside back cover, Celestron saying, light pollution, what light pollution? Well, look at the picture of LA, that's what light pollution. I was really perturbed with Celestron and, and Sky and Telescope for this, but they're actually good organizations. They get it, they've been active on light pollution, Sky and Telescope, Kelly Beatty was on our board. They know the issue. So I, I thought about this more. What upset me more is marketing people at Celestron think that this is a message it's gonna to sell to amateur astronomers, because it has, okay? And it's one thing to say, hey, we realize light pollution is a problem. We're gonna give you some equipment so you can at least continue to do your hobby. But it's another thing to say, what light pollution? That type of rhetoric just doesn't belong anywhere in a, a discussion of light pollution. So uh, I've overcome my frustration with this. I'm not negative on using technology, but we just need to examine how we're looking at the hobby. And I'll give you an example. I saw something on uh, one of the astronomy websites when the, the, the satellite constellations came up and someone posted, well, it's not really a problem. You handle it in post-processing until you can't, you know, because it's not going to go away. It's not going to stay at this level. We're all going to be boiled frogs if we don't wake up to the fact that this problem is going to continue to get worse unless we can build enough support to do something about it. Okay, so what can you do? Um, I do have a few suggestions. We'll go on. Uh, more assertive on outreach. We all do outreach, right? Outreach is great. I love this picture. I don't know which club, because it's doing there's such crummy conditions. Look at those lights. I mean, the first item of discussion on your outreach here should be, we have really bad light pollution at this location. We'll show you Saturn or Jupiter, but this is terrible for seeing the night sky. Um, all of you need to educate yourself about the negative impacts of light pollution. In February, I did a private star party in Tucson, and they were actually a group of uh, traveling RVers uh, who, who I know. And I talked to them not only about what they were seeing, but light pollution. I talked a lot about the health consequences of light pollution. And about three days later, I saw that one of the women there who has a, a blog that's fairly successful wrote entirely about the health impacts of light pollution. She said this changed her life because she never realized that light had a negative consequence to her personal health. The outreach can get the message across in many different ways. And I just ask, when you do outreach, think about the message. Think about your audience, what's going to sell. Yeah. This is a real tough one. More activism on public policy. Here's my Venn diagram. These are amateur astronomers. These are social activists. And my premise is this is more than zero because I'm here, OK? These are not groups that tend to overlap, right? Why? Why is that? Well, look, let's be honest. We're a group, our hobby consists mostly, we do it in the dark by ourselves. We're introverts. We're an introverted group of people, you know? It's not bad to be an introvert. Read the book Quiet by Susan Cain. She says, most of the work on the planet gets done by introverted. But by personality, most of us are not people who are gonna go out become social activists. I have legal training. I was trained to stand up and talk to people. A lot of you have technical engineering training. It's just not what you were trained to do. But everyone has a skill set that can contribute to uh, activism and advocacy for the night sky. So I ask you, try to find whatever way you're comfortable with to contribute. 
Um, one of the criticisms I heard said, well, you know, this is sort of a liberal cause. I'm a, I'm a conservative. I don't want to get involved with government regulation. Okay. Actually, the history of the environmental movement in the United States has been heavily bipartisan from the beginning. You want to go see a, a jurisdiction that's good on night skies now? Go to Utah, one of the most conservative states in the country. And I will give anyone who identifies as conservative uh, a message on how you can deal with uh, active and be true to your causes. The number one cause of light pollution is bad public infrastructure that your taxes are paying for. You're paying for the street lights. You're paying for the buildings that stay on all night, the public buildings. You're paying for the bad playing fields. You're paying for George Mason University, which has, you know, bad lighting. Attack the waste of public funds that's being utilized for bad public infrastructure. And I put up the American flag. And, you know, the problem with symbols is we always look at things as symbols and then they become a symbol. What I see is an indigo blue dark sky with 50 bright stars. Okay, dark skies are a part of our American heritage and we should be protecting it no matter what your political beliefs are. All right, let's go. Coalitions. Here's another one that's not so comfortable. You need to reach out and be working with other groups. Birders are great. Birders are as good as astronomers on dark sky issues. This week in Connecticut, the legislature unanimously approved a law that says all public building lights will go off at midnight during migration season. Say, oh, during migration season. Read the law five months of the year. Five months of the year, public buildings have to have their lights off. It's a coalition of birders and dark sky advocates. Uh, you know, we get emotional about the loss of the night sky. They stand at the base of buildings and catch dead birds. So, you know, they are very invested in improving lighting to protect wildlife. Yeah. Um, these are global warming activists. Uh, Global warming is the environmental issue. It's soaking up all the broadband on environmental issues. Lighting is part of wasted energy that relates to climate change. And these happen to be people of color. There's a whole separate issue of environmental justice. And if you look at lighting, if we want to do something in cities, most of the worst lighting is in poor neighborhoods. Health. Young woman who's into holistic health. She's probably a vegetarian or a vegan. She does yoga. She might even be into astrology. But you know what? She's one of the strongest market demographics you can find. And if she knows that light pollution is going to contribute to breast cancer and many other issues, she's going to be on board and she's going to be a helpful advocate. And I've seen them in the international groups around the world. There's a strong group of young environmentally conscious women who can be very helpful on the movement. Kids, I uh, was in Maryland doing uh, water pollution work. Uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation had an entire program directed to kids in the Maryland schools. It was their major outreach. They put materials in the skill, schools and kids turned around and started lecturing their parents about water pollution. So we need to figure out how to engage with kids as well. Okay, next one. Support for dark skies. We need money, we need to grow. And you know what the picture is? NEF, Northeast Astronomy Forum, biggest trade show of the year. How many of you gone to NEF? No one? Okay. Well, people spend a lot of money at NEF. And the great thing about our hobby is we've got people who grind their own lenses and use PVC pipes to make their uh, telescopes. And we have people who build $100,000 home observatories, range of discretionary income. But some 
pretty much everyone sending sp spending some money. So my only request is next time you spend some money on a piece of astronomy equipment, think about spending some money to IDA. It doesn't have to be a lot of money. Just use it as an occasion for you to think about what are you doing to support dark skies. Okay, next one. Can light pollution be defeated? My answer to that is certainly. And I hear a lot of people say, no, you really can't do anything about it. People are too concerned about lighting. It's too difficult. You have too much to do. And I try to ignore them. If I have to respond, my response is this. If you can't be part of the movement, then just get out of the way, OK? Because there are people on this planet who are going to address this problem. But I also am convinced we can do it because I know some history. Um, Cleveland, 1969, the Cuyahoga River caught on fire. This was the most important moment in the environmental movement in the United States because people woke up and said, you know, it's not a good thing for our waterways to be on fire. And a bipartisan group passed the Clean Water Act signed by President Richard Nixon. And you know what? Today, with 70% more population, our water is cleaner than it has been in 200 years. Now, you know, there's always some backsliding. Uh, Supreme Court did a recent decision on wetlands. It's not so good. But the reality is we as a society cleaned up our waters because we realized it was important. Next slide. Air pollution's much the same story. Here we've got Los Angeles in 1968. And we had all this uh, wildfire pollution this week. I've used this as an occasion to talk to many young people, tell them this is what Pittsburgh looked like in 1965. It's what Philadelphia looked like. We had filthy air in many of our cities in the 1960s. They have it in China today, and we did something about it. California really led the way in clean air protection, and this doesn't occur anymore in Los Angeles, except when you get wildfires in the area. What we didn't do a good job on are the colorless and odorless CO2s, um, and we, ha we have global warming. But again, our air, with 70% more population, is cleaner than it was in 1968 or many years earlier. So we have a record of solving these environmental problems. Next one. And here's light pollution today. I sincerely believe that 50 years from now, people are gonna look at pictures like this and say, what were they thinking? Why were they wasting energy from fossil fuels to light up cities for the light to go up into space. How did that make any sense as a society? I've heard astronauts in the space shuttle say, it's beautiful to look down on the Earth and look at the lights. But then you think, someone coming from another planet looking at this saying, what are these people doing? Why are they shooting light up into their atmosphere, just wasting energy? So, next slide. What will the future look like? Well, I would like to say is this future. This is 1994 in Los Angeles when the power system failed and people could see people could see the Milky Way for the first time and reported it to the police department. You know, they thought we were being invaded. So we will not get to this. Certainly we won't get to this in the evening hours. Maybe we could get something closer to this for two or three o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, we sometimes in dark sky movement use this and say, you know, light pollution is the easiest uh, pollution to fix. You know, you just have to turn out the light, turn the switch, and it changes. That's too simplistic. I can tell you right now, solving light pollution is a difficult problem that's going to take 20 or 30 years. The same way that dealing with water pollution and air pollution did. Um, so, you know, I'd like to say I could change this tomorrow, but this is a long battle, but it's one we can win. Okay, next slide. I'm heading back to Orion. Remember a globe at night? We looked at Orion. This is magnitude seven. 
Well, it so happens, a few weeks before I became president of the International Dark Sky Association, my daughter gave birth to her third child, my fifth grandchild, and named him Orion, which I thought was really cool, you know, great name. But it really brought home to me, you know, this battle is not for our generation. This battle is for future generations so that children of the generation of young Orion will grow up and be able to see the night sky. That's the mission of the International Dark Sky Association, now Dark Sky International. It's my personal mission. I hope you will join us in it. So I'll leave with the question, what are you doing to save the night sky? Thank you. Questions? We got time. We got time. <laughs> Good. So, uh, let's, let's, go for it. Let's start with the room here. Yeah. Then we'll, then we'll go on. The yeah. Line. Okay. Well, we kind of digest here. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Job. Thank you. I, I think you know uh, we all kind of know what it, know what it is, but not really. Yeah. I think you really brought home for me, especially like being more assertive in outreach. You yeah. know, we're great at telling people how to join NOVAC Council or stuff, but I think we can do better at that. One thing. But. Uh, yeah, any questions here in the room and then we'll get to the Don line. Of course, I mean, <laughs> and you'll have, we'll repeat your question because folks online yeah. won't hear it. So, yeah, what, what is your question? <laughs> okay, with all the magic constellations coming up, going up, and it's so it's changing the night sky and the stars are moving. Right? Right. That's what I heard. Right, right. So, how's that going to affect the birds? Vibration and the sea creatures and all these animals. Yep. That's, that's a, uh, she's asking how the, the satellite mega constellations are going to affect wildlife, such as migration of birds. Um, the, the, the satellite constellations is, is a distinct problem, and it's, it's a harder problem into showing the biodiversity impact. But there is biodiversity impact because birds do navigate by the night sky, turtles, other wildlife reference the night sky. There is impact. It's not as severe as the impact of bright lights in their habitat. Okay. All right, so let's we'll kind of bounce back. Yeah. All right, John, here's your chance. You got a couple of queued up questions for uh, John Birch, for uh, Tom. Hey, Tom. Yes. Yeah. Oh, John Birch, can you ask your question? Sorry, free control, free audio controls. Okay. Can you okay. hear me now? Yep. Okay. What percentage of energy is uh, of all energy consumption is light? What percentage of all light is polluting? Um, Additionally, the question uh, continues with uh, how much pollu additional air pollution is caused by that light generation. Yep. So those, I, I will tell you, those are all hard questions for which the technical solutions can be argued, okay? And it depends on what base you're looking at. I've seen that, uh, you know, like... Uh, Street lights are 2.5 percent of the consumption of uh, of of energy, um, but uh, light is a minority portion of our energy co uh, consumption because we've got manufacturing, um, heating, cooling are taking up uh, a lot. Um, so it's not it's not the predominant share. Um, what percentage of all light is polluting? Uh, you know, I, I said, you know, the definition we're using is all light is a pollutant. I think the question is, what percentage of lighting could you could you reduce without a, a, a significant impact on how we uh, live as a society? I think we could go with half to a third of the amount of light we're using now. I mean, just look on street lights. Street lights are a major pollutant. 
you know, what's going to happen when we transition to more automated cars? Are those street lights all necessary? Uh, we have a lot of lights in our society that are staying on all night long. And if you think about it in terms of time frame, there's much more important social use for light in evening hours than there is overnight. Overnight tends to be, oh, it's a security light. Well, security lights don't work if they're on all the time. Motion activated lights work, work much more. So the bottom line is we can substantially reduce our light consumption without a major impact on our society. We have done so historically. World War II, we had blackouts so that uh, U-boats could not see convoys along the coast. The entire East Coast was blocked out. They didn't stop living. They, you know, they put curtains on their windows. They, they did many things and were able to reduce the light without a major impact on lifestyle. Okay. Mike Brook, uh, your, your question, you want to state it? Oh. It's from my wife, Jean. I'll let her ask her question. Yeah. Yeah, here in Fauquier County, they have dark sky friendly light codes, but they're ge generally ignored because there's no availability of glare shields yeah. um, for existing light fixtures, especially floodlights, and people don't want to change their existing figures uh, fixtures. So I was wondering about the availability of retrofitted glare shields and also what's the headway in getting industry standards changed for all new light fixtures. Yeah, um, as I said, uh, industry is not there in most forms of lighting. Sports lighting, I think you can find good lighting. The problem is lighting winds up being a very commodity product uh, and you know the cheapest model gets sold in the marketplace. I think your, your comment, so generally we have a lack of fixtures that we have to work with manufacturers on. But also your comment goes to the issue of you can have a local ordinance then it doesn't get enforced. This is really important. Uh, I strongly believe, and I'm a lawyer, uh, you need to have private rights of action to challenge light pollution. If, the, if, the, if your neighbor's light is not in conformance with the local ordinance, it shouldn't be a matter of just uh, some local official having to see it and come see it. You should be able to take them to court and say, you're in nonconformance. That's a light trespass. You're interfering with my use of my land. I've got a claim against you. Those claims will be quickly negotiated. But it's a, it's an absolute legal protection we need to work on. Okay. Okay. Willie Williams, state your question. Uh, any thought of putting grids? as in photography. You're not talking shields, you're actually talking directional grids. Is that your question? I think he's referring to things like egg crate grids or, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the place where this has been done actually very effectively in, is in sports lighting. Um, Musco Lighting out of Iowa is a very environmentally conscious organization. I've visited their factory, and they basically do directional lighting as a way for effectively doing sports lighting. So they can cut off lighting at the playing field edge. So there is the possibility of both uh, how, the, how the light source is constructed and how you shield it. You can substantially reduce the trespass into other areas, but most areas we have the product out in the marketplace yet that will do it effectively. Okay. Next question. Manjun. Manjuna Rao. Uh, yeah, uh, mine was just a comment. I think yeah. I have seen around uh, Rockville and Gaithersburg area where these car dealerships have very bright lights over their vehicle lots, just like uh, you mentioned about the stadium lights. So yeah, there is something that could be done to. Yeah, they're know, they're 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 a problem. Let me say, I, you know, I I said automobiles as a source, uh, yeah. car dealership, gas stations, um, 
electronic signs directed at cars. I mean, you can go down the list. A lot of our light pollution, even skyline lighting, building lighting, is often directed towards people driving by, not people walking by. Yeah, yeah. So uh, part of our lighting problem is automobiles. And uh, it's a hard problem to solve, but it's one that you know we're giving attention to. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Okay. Jeffrey Kretsch. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I had two of them there, and one is um, and I, I know you're fully aware of this with the yeah. uh, the tobacco industry. You know, was right. for for a long time people were losing cases because said, well, if I want to smoke or or you know the danger yeah. of smoking, well, you know, tough luck to you that you had this health problem. It was only when the secondhand smoke came in they said, well, that person didn't choose to do this, right. and I, I think your your health things with lighting on that. I think that that shows the way where you really can make progress for people that didn't choose to have this lighting are suffering the impact of it. Yeah. So I, I think you've got to, I mean, that, that's one definite approach we have to do and, and people care about health anyway. Yeah, I mean, you know, there it's, there's an ethic in our society, well, I can do whatever the hell I want to on my own property. That's true. Uh, you can build a swimming pool, but the water can't come over on my property and flood out my house. Lighting is really no different. I mean, uh, people have to understand that what you do on your property should stay on your property. And if you shield your lights, the lights will stay on your property. And we need, we need for the legal structure. There are jurisdictions that do recognize light trespass. It's not everywhere. It's not as well established in the law as it should be. But it's something we need to work towards. And it's, it's making human awareness as well as legal protection. Okay. And I think I had, yeah. Oh, I had the second one too about the. Um, um, it's related to that uh, advertisement there about we're you know we're defeating light pollution if I put in those words you know and and I, I've seen some beautiful photographs you know I, you know at the uh, observatory park where we we do some observing people have done some beautiful you know photographs there and I said could you do that same photograph because I know you go out to you know someone go out to Ball Knob or Spruce Knob. Could you do a do a do a similar one as you can there, and then give us a comparison so that we can come back and say, "Yeah, I got a great photograph. Look how much better I got in a dark sky." And you know, so get some one, one one of the things we found out is that when people assess their own skies, a lot of times people think, "Oh, I've got a pretty dark sky," and when you look at the data, it's it's not so. So uh, very few people are seeing truly dark skies. They're not even seeing rural, normal rural skies at this point. Uh, what they're seeing is suburban and suburban city transition skies, most places in the United States. And, uh, you know, we have to increase awareness. Unfortunately, you know, not everyone looks up. Um, so looking at the sky is a big part of it. But as I said, we have to expand our message to other issues. My view is when you do outreach and if you get someone who says well you know i really don't care about seeing the night sky and the answer is if you can't see the night sky then your health is being jeopardized by light pollution where you live bottom line and the creatures living around you are being jeopardized by the light where you live that's the message it needs to get out last one online so okay anything yeah. I'm, just, I'm, I'm also a hiker in preservation of um, everything in what the um, environment. And one of the things I've noticed for our cause, yeah. that community well. is broadening the number of people that care. Yeah. The people the National Park. And yeah. Your approach by broadening that coalition is the only thing in a democratic, the elected, representative form of government to get people's attention. We need quantities of people yeah. and you have to engage the economics and industry yeah. and business as well. I, I would say the National Park Service is completely on board. We've done many joint things with them. Their night sky programs are the most attended programs they have and they always include a, a dark sky message. 
so the you know least head portion of the government is very responsive. Surprisingly, one of the other agencies in the United States that is really on the dark skies is the Defense Department. They actually realize that brightly lit facilities are not the safest if you're uh, conducting a military operation. They understand the light has to be directed where it where it needs to go. So, um, I think the outreach we do through the parks is very, very important. Um, and, uh, you know, when you've got 300 people come to Crockett on a night, those are 300 people who can learn something about dark skies and go away and think about it. So, anything else? Last call here in the room. Anybody online? Oh, got one yep. Here? Hi. When you said you had a designation of uh, dark skies or sort of flames of around, you know, five and you get Right. What's the so what of that? Is, is, is there anything analogous to like when a place uh, is in the state of the National Park Register where there's some national place in the um, Okay, the, the question is whether a dark sky designation carries with it any legal protection like National Historic Designation. The answer is no. Um, it's really bragging rights, and it's the ability to market the location as a dark sky place. That is enormously valuable for astrotourism. It also is enormously valuable for increasing awareness in the community and building support for the areas around uh, the dark sky place. We, ha we have a number of different designations. You know, there are parks, there are sanctuaries, there are reservations. There are, they vary in size. And we're beginning to have urban places, which may not be dark in the sense that astronomers think, but are being used as outreach places to show improved lighting. And uh, it really has done a good job in raising awareness in most locations. And internationally, it is enormously important to prestige. Our, our uh, executive uh, director just came back from both China and Taiwan, where they wanted dark sky parks designated. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. yeah, you like. I just want to make a plug for the Earth at Night Sky Study. Because yeah. we have one that's almost uh, going to be designated at Turner Farms Park Observatory, yeah. Great Falls. It'll be mm -hmm. what the Hopefully it'll be the seventh, maybe the eighth yeah. globally. So this is exciting for yeah. And then have an eighth and observatory here before you the mid Atlantic. But then you got a lot of stuff. Actually, Virginia is a hot spot for dark sky in the East Coast. I mean, you can go to Maine, get something really dark, West Virginia, go up to Cherry Springs. But we still have some places that are reasonably dark and we have a lot of interest. And we're next to the nation's capital. So uh, very important. And Novak has been very important in supporting all those efforts. One last question. One last question. Who is it? Um, Patricia. Patricia. Uh, Eileen Craigie, sitting in this room, <laughs> uh, is the local contact for information. Um, Eileen, is your... Uh, Contact information on the Novak site? Yep. <laughs> we'll make sure it is. We'll make sure it is. Okay. We'll put it in the, uh, here I can, I can yeah. be, be take the mic. You're good. Uh, yeah, so Patricia, if it's okay, Eileen, maybe we'll put your e email in the chat box too because you're super conduit for this kind of stuff. And uh, as you know, you've done so much for the, for the mission here. So I want to give Tom a round of applause too. Um, um, it's an amazing, difficult mission. Um, it's fantastic to have uh, have an advocate like you, Tom, with, with all the background and all the motivation and enthusiasm. Um, that's what it's going to take. Um, so appreciate that very much, Tom. For, for Novak folks, of course, we have a lot of cool outreach coming up. Um, if you want to participate, send a note to our, our, our outreach email, um, outreach at novak.com. And we'd love to see you there. Uh, a lot of a lot of stuff coming up this week. So, 
Uh, any final thoughts for anybody online? Any questions? Yeah, I think I had one I wanted to make. Uh, okay, Jeff. I'm not sure if they, they understood the point I was trying to make. We get these great images, you know, from people's backyard and say, golly gee, Kawilligers, there is no, you know, light pollution. Look at my image. And I've talked to some of them because I know that they do go out to dark sky sites. And I say, please image the same object you did and give us a comparison of that same thing. So we can say, look how much better it was when I was in a dark sky compared to here. Um, that's something we could do, you know, as, as part of a Novak here that, that might help fight that idea that, gee, we can we can mitigate this dark sky, you know, you know, stuff with this modern technology. And uh, I think we could get a set of example images for selected objects to show what the difference really is, even for the very good technology we have. You know, uh, astrophotography is great, but like all photography, it, it lies at a certain level, right? You know, it's telling something you, you can't see. So uh, maybe we need some more disclaimers and comparisons on our website to show what the world is, is really like. Yeah, but do you think it? But doesn't it make a difference if you go to a dark site and use the same equipment, and everything, looking at the same object? Uh, you wouldn't have identical uh, images, would you? Surely, it makes an impact when you don't have when you're not fighting light pollution. Unless those guys are right that we have defeated light pollution, I, I think we need it to, to show people that yeah, you're seeing these great images. But that we're not paying it, but we're paying a cost because we, uh, if we don't have a truly dark sky to take them from, and and that's what I think uh, we could actually show. I'm planning to go to the Cherry Spring Star Party next week, and I will tell you it would be loaded with astrophotographers who are there because it's better conditions for doing their work than what yeah. they have at home. Yeah, and if they just show a couple of comparison photographs and say, "Look at the Orion number here and there." Uh, they would do a lot to, to, f to fight some of the advertisements you're seeing on the uh, that we were showing here saying, hey, you just use this equipment and what terms of light pollution they you'd show the difference if you if you use the same objects, uh, both from the dark site you went to and your home uh, where, where it's light polluted. Uh, just a set of, of comparison objects like that. Otherwise, it makes it look like who, who cares? You just get, you know, pay for fancy equipment. So you got to show that it actually costs uh, your your imaging ability because you have light pollution. Uh, it shouldn't be that hard hard to do. I've asked a few people who've had great images that I know go out to dark sites to say, please image the same object, and then put them side by side. Yeah, yeah maybe Jeff, you can uh, capture some of your thoughts there. Shoot it out to some of our astrophotographers who are, you know, they're top and then <laughs> we have some of the best in the world. Yeah, um, yeah, and I think they're, they're, they could play a key role in this. So, um, you might want to reach out to them directly. I, I yeah, maybe you know, you may be onto something there, but uh, grab a few of those folks and see what they think. Okay, yeah, yes, yeah, because I think we ought to give that a shot there, right? Uh, okay, um, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Um, I know there were a couple of comments wanting to reach out to you, uh, Tom, directly in the chat, but we can we can forward those to you. Um, they're not really questions, so. Um, that's it for us tonight. Thanks, thanks everyone for, for uh, showing up here and for dialing in online. And we'll see you out on the observing fields. Good night, everyone.